I think today's conference, I want to offer it as a, I've been getting a lot of, um, I've been noticing that some people, they get discouraged because they find their spiritual life gets a bit more tippet at times. And I've been getting more phone calls uh, with people asking how to get out of that. And it it, it, it does get hard um, climbing out of that sometimes. But the I hope this conference will be kind of a, a nudge. It's, it's very similar to many other conferences I give. Uh, but I felt like it was needed, and and I, I will I will admit that this conference was needed for myself. We've been doing so much work on the land out there and and up at our friary that when we work too much, um, like Saint Francis says, we're to work but not to extinguish the spirit of prayer. Uh, when you start finding yourself only thinking about work, getting losing your patience, not being present to your family, all these kind of things. Um, our devotion starts to get uh, squashed a little bit. Or it, 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 um, that's where we become cold and tippid. And we feel like we don't love God. We don't know how to climb back out of it. And then we, get, we go through this period of dryness. So I want to address it, uh, at least to give you maybe a, um, um, an encouragement to relight the fire of your devotion. So we look at Holy Scripture. And oh, I didn't even write down a quote. It's from Luke chapter 12. When our Lord talks about, I was meditating on this more recently, and um, I, I found it fruitful. Um, when he says, I am come to cast fire on the earth. And what will I? But that, that it be kindled, we all know the we all know the quote. But that's not where I want to start. I want to go just before that quote. And unto whomsoever much is given, of him much shall be required, and to whom they have committed much, of him they will demand the more. Now I want to give a couple of maybe let's just look at this quote a little bit. For us, we need to think about the value of our vocation. Now, when I say vocation, I know people talk about that all the time. You get sick of hearing it nowadays. In the New Catechism, it says vocation. You look it up in the back. It's written in there like a hundred times, maybe a couple hundred times, but everything's a vocation now. Before, when we talked about a vocation, we talked about a supernatural thing, supernatural calling from God. You all have entered into that, and I don't mean in your marriages, because that's a natural vocation that gets supernaturalized, as it were, through the sacrament. But the sacrament itself is a great mystery, as we know, as we've already talked about, uh, because of the fact you have two members of the body of Christ becoming one body. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great mystery. But it's not that the state in and of itself is supernatural, because it's not. Even pagans get married, right? But the fact that you've entered into religious life, even though it's secular religious life, now there's something very special there. You've entered into a vocation. I've talked to many of you on the phone. Some of, maybe some of you have entered for the wrong reasons, I don't know. But I know that some of you have entered because you just feel this, you feel this deep desire to be more closely bound to God and in His service, according to your state in life. And so when we look at this, we have to look at the value of our vocation as Catholics, because there is a vocation there. It means, it means to live our confirmation, our baptismal and confirmation grace. But then you've added to that through a secular religious form of life, right? The life of prayer, the life of penance, uh, the duty that you have in following the rule, all, whatever that means according to your state in life, because it's going it, to, it gets adapted by every individual. It helps us uh, in each in individual ways how we're supposed to do that. So we think on the value of that. Now remember, here's the quote we're looking at. And unto whomsoever much is given, a vocation is given, of him much shall be required, and unto whom they have committed much, who are they? That they have committed much of him, they will demand the more. So think where, this isn't for all of you, but think where some of you were just a few years ago. Some of you, the filth that might have been in your life, um, the indulgence you might have taken uh, in that filth, the error which you might have professed and even taught to others. And we see that, you know, we convert. 
we convert and we look back and we see what filthiness we used to do. We, we look back and we see what, what ignorant things we used to be, we used to be masters of and, and teach to other people. I mean, before I became a friar, I remember walking through the forest. I, I always thought I was a good Catholic, but I remember walking through the forest with Protestants. And at that point in time, I was learning survival and all this other stuff. I taught survival at the university and whatever else, wilderness survival. And I remember talking to this Protestant who they took the, they took their faith very seriously, whatever that means. Um, but they were believers according to what they believe. And there I am talking about shamanics. Shamanics is like the Indian spiritual guides that, and it was about like seeing auras and trees and like becoming invisible. It's weirdo stuff, right? But I, I didn't consider myself a weirdo. I was just a good Catholic that read books on shamanics, right? Until you finally wake up one day and be like, this doesn't make any sense. But of course, you know, a lot of us go through life. We don't have anybody really showing us the way. You're just trying to sort things out. Well, then we look back and we see what, what ridiculousness filled our life until the light of the gospel actually came into our life and sorted things out for us and everything just became clear, right? Well, we look at that. For us, much has been given. We look at how the great mystery of God has been so patient or the great mercy of God has been so patient with us and how he's even called us to a greater intimacy with him. Do you see? Because anytime he's called us to prayer, he's calling us to an intimacy with him. It's not just like, he wants us to come on, sign on, be a member of something so that we get to wear this scapular and say that we're members of this thing and have to do this meeting once a month. No, it's because he wants us to be united to him more deeply, more profoundly. The other stuff's external. The intimacy with God is internal. It, it, is, it, is, it is the essence of why we become a secular religious. Not putting on the scapular, not going to the meeting, not doing all those. Those are all external. They're consequences of the fact but the group itself, or the, the, the form of life itself, is for that intimacy. We've been called to it, right? So our Lord calls us from this, in, this, in His great mercy, being so patient with us, calling us to that form of intimacy, and forgetting, as it were, our Lord forgets, as it were, all of the foolish infidelity we've had in the past. And we hope that we can say in the past. Because remember, we have to climb out of that. We, we, we're not to have that, that, that foolish infidelity anymore. We're not to have filthiness anymore. We're to leave all that stuff behind. We have to be new men, new women. St. Paul talks about the armor of Christ. We have to put that on and fight. And if you want to read about that, St. Saint Paul goes on about what we're fighting with in which hand and when. And we have to be living that way. So to you, that is to us, much has been given as it's written. Our Lord has come in water and in blood. 1 John 5, 6. Now, why did he come in water and in blood? We read that 1 John, it's the letter of John, not, not the first chapter of John, but the first letter of St. John, chapter 5, verse 6. He has come to us by water and blood, not just by water, but blood, right? Now, this is a gift. Our Lord comes to us and we're going to give our own commentary on this right now. I, I, I'm sure with the fathers, there's, there's better commentary. I'm not trying to say, but, but, but in my meditation, this is what, what I was thinking of. The water is sanctification, right? Because our baptism, he comes to us by water and he comes to us by blood. That is the consummation being consumed in his blood, right? So, so the, the consummation coming by his blood. And that's what gives the sanctification to the water. For this intimacy, which, has, which he has called us, it's sealed in his blood, it's sealed in his death, and it's sealed in his passion. Now, it might seem like that's, uh, I've got the, the, the order wrong, but it's okay. Even in the litany of the saints, they always get the order wrong, right? They'll say his... Um, um, you know, like his death and his suffering or something like that. So it, it, the, the order we're not worried about. We're, we're worried about the, we're, we're concerned with the different elements and entering into these, meditating on these. Therefore, to whom much has been given, that is to us, 
they, meaning the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, they will demand the more. What do they demand? And this is what a lot of us fear. I've noticed that sometimes Christians will get, uh, now when I say Christians, I, I only mean Catholics. Um, those who have the, the, the perennial apostolic faith. So a lot of times you, you Christians will get a bit, they'll get this heart heartened because they, they feel like, they feel like, um, when God demands the more from us, we just don't have more to give. Why does he demand so much from us? But what's he demanding from us? He demands a response. He's demanding a response from the gift that he's given, right? And unto whomsoever much has been given, of him much shall be required, and to him they have committed much, of him they will demand the more. Well, he gives us a gift. And so this, this gift, they demand the more. That is a response to the gift. And for God, that's love. He, 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 he demands from us love in return for the water and the blood, in return for the sanctification and the means by which it comes, his great sacrifice. But oftentimes, being out there in the world, you get drugged down because of all the stuff that's going on. And I've given you this quote here before from Hebrews 12, 12. Therefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight steps with your feet that no one halting may go out of the way, but rather be healed. He wants us to be healed. Healed from what? Here we would say healed from our dryness of heart. He wants us to be healed from the tepidity of our prayer, from the monotony of us not striving with zeal, right? And this is what happens being out there in the world. And I feel it myself when I have to deal with this property over here and, and all the work we had the last week, last week the bees, Unfortunately, we took out too many. We have too many beehives now, but the bees swarmed every single day. They swarmed on Monday and we caught them. They swarmed on Tuesday, but it started to rain, so they flew back to their hive. They swarmed on, but we still had to sit down there and watch them to see where they were going to go. Then they swarmed three times, different beehives, three swarms on Wednesday. One went 50 feet in a tree, and I decided not to climb the tree to try to get them because it just wasn't worth trying to risk my life to get you know, a couple of bees. But we caught the other two swarms, and we had then then you catch them, then you got to put them into a hive, which is a beautiful thing to watch. Then they swarmed on Thursday, one on Thursday, one on Friday, one on Saturday. So now we have lots of beehives. But that was a lot of work, and I realized when I got up on Sunday, I was utterly exhausted and can barely speak because we were just constantly going, missing prayer. But we're trying to have a priest come out now and bless the bees because I think it's a diabolic thing that the devil's trying to kill us through the bees. But after all that kind of work, and whatever that work is on the natural, if we, if we do that work outside of the purpose of our life, that is to give glory and honor to God, then what we find is the spiritual life becomes uh, more and more distant to us. So it becomes more and more mundane. We become more and more secular. We embrace and grasp onto whatever it is that we can actually see and touch and feel and smell, whereas God, I can't see him. I can go look at the Eucharist, but I still have to believe. So I don't see God face to face. I can't touch him. I don't, I can call on him, but he might not answer. At least I might not be able to hear the answer. There's so much there that just revolves, that, that involves faith. And if I'm weak and I'm tired, because I'm over, I'm overly extending myself in the natural. Then I start to lose contact uh, with um, with that great gift, and so my knees get feeble, my hands hang down. I might not be, I might have halting step, getting tired of the spiritual life, not making the way properly. But again, our Lord says He wants us to be healed. 
He meaning he wants us to shake off our tepidity, our dryness, our coldness of heart in the service of the Lord. But how? Because this comes up all the time, and I actually have people say, but how, friar? What am I supposed to do? Well, honestly, you have to light a fire back underneath you. And it's tough. Sometimes you just got to wrestle with God like Jacob did. And you're going to come out with a limp just like he did. But you have to wrestle with God. And that's what he wants you to do. We have to understand. And if you want to understand more about this, just pull out your book, the third spiritual alphabet, and look in the index. Now, if you have the red one, it's going to be hard to figure it out. But if you have the blue one, you'll be able to find it in the index there. Is that what the front's called, an index? Yeah. You can look in the, the table of contents in the front of the book. I went to public school. And so you can find it's in, it's in the it's in like the it's it's back in the back at the end of the book in the 400s in the pages in the 400s. But it starts to talk about the reasons God will give this dryness and they are punishments. They're punishments to us because it could be for sin, it could be for past sin, it could be for present sin, it could also be for the fact that we're not trying hard enough to unite ourselves to the living God. Who, who is longing for us to be united to him. You see? Think about it. He's jealous. Let me read you a quote before I get too far. I think that quote's coming up. I don't know. Let me just start reading stuff. So, but how? St. Bernard says this. It's right that the fervor of holy desire should precede God's presence. So your dryness is coming because you don't feel God's presence. I just want to kind of give it so you understand a little bit better. Your, your tepidity, your dryness, your coldness, coldness of heart, it's coming because you don't have holy fervor. That's why there's dryness. And God's presence isn't there. I'm sorry, it's God's presence. God's presence isn't there because you don't have the fervor. You don't have the holy desire. And that's what we're talking about here. How do you get it back? So it's right that the fervor of holy desire, says St. Bernard, should precede God's presence in the soul to which he intends to come. For it consumes and, and does always, it does away, I'm sorry, it does away with the rust of vices and makes ready a place for the Lord. Francis de Osuna continues this, he says, That this fervor of holy desire or zeal, we may call the messenger of God. Does that make sense? So Bernard says it's a fervor of holy desire precedes the presence of God. Francis de Osuna is saying the fervor of holy desire or zeal, we may call the messenger of God. That like another St. John the Baptist calls to us in the desert of our soul, that is, the dryness of our devotion, not to harden our hearts, and to make straight, so not to harden our hearts, that is, the way of the Lord, and to make straight the paths of our desires, to do penance, and to baptize ourselves, in tears, that's repentance, to baptize ourselves in tears so that there may be manifested to us the kingdom of God that is hidden within us. Remember that this kingdom of God, this, um, this I'm sorry, remember that this kingdom is a kingdom of love and not a kingdom of knowledge of the will and not of the intellect. You people out there always want to just try to learn more and think that that's going to bring you the fervor. That's not how it works. The kingdom of God in us is in love. God is love. He dwells in love. He fills us with love. We respond to him with knowledge. No, we respond to him with love. If you want him to dwell in you, the knowledge comes by, by, by pr promoting that fervor and holy desire leads to zeal, which is love. And therefore, it precedes the presence of God.
This zeal for God renews the forces of the soul and gets rid of its earthly propensities, all the work, all the concerns, all the anxieties for things that you know are just going to pass. But the only reason you're anxious over them is because you're not doing anything for God. You're doing it for the world, for taking care of yourself, for whatever else it is. So this zeal for God renews the forces of the soul and gets rid of its earthly propensities, as God declares in Sophronius. With the fire of my jealousy shall all the earth be devoured. With the fire of my jealousy shall all the earth be devoured. Because then I will restore to the people a chosen lip. A chosen lip, that is to speak the truth, to speak of him. I will restore to the people a chosen lip that all may call on the name of the Lord and may serve him with one shoulder. What in the world does that mean? We'll serve him with one shoulder. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Remember? One shoulder. You don't, you don't need to serve him with two. St. Francis they saw him holding up the entire ladder in church, the Pope did, with one shoulder. That's the way uh, Giotto uh, depicts it in the upper basilica at Assisi. Outside of St. John Lateran Church, if there's a, on the other side of the road, it's a very busy road there coming under the, into the, I don't know what the thing's called. Anyways, there's a big statue, a huge statue of St. Francis there with his kind of followers down at his feet. And St. Francis has his hands in the air. It's very weird. Like you don't see statues. He's got a hood up and his hands are like this. It seems like it's weird until you go and get behind that statue. Because in front of that is St. John Lateran Church. When you get behind that statue and get off to the corner there, his hands are on the pillars. You see his hands right on the pillars with the door in the very center. He's just holding up the church. Most people don't know that. They just don't even pay any attention to that statue. Um, but it's a beautiful thing. So I encourage anybody that's going to go to Rome, I always take people there and see that. After, when we do the seven church pilgrimage, we'll walk all the seven churches for the get the indulgence. We'll stop and have lunch right there before we go to St. John Lateran Church. And right there, where St. Francis is holding up the church. But he's doing it effortlessly. But here in, in Sophronius, we have the same thing. We have the, to serve him with one shoulder. Let me read the whole quote again. It's magnificent. With the fire of my jealousy shall all the earth be devoured. Do you see? God does not want you to be divided amongst your work. He wants you to work for him. You have to do secular things. You all have duties out in the world, but you don't have to do it for the world. That's the thing. You can do it for him. He has to stay the center. He's jealous for you. And he wants to devour everything in that jealousy. Because then I will restore to my people a chosen lip, Meaning, if you have him before your eyes and not the world, you have him to speak of and not the world and its filthiness. That all, that all may call on the name of the Lord, that is for your every necessity. And those who think of God, think, they call on him for everything. Why? Because he, he can give you everything. We don't just do it when, when we become actually in need because we realize everything comes from him. And may serve him with one shoulder. So he comes by fire and blood. I know we used before water and blood. But I want to talk about fire and blood. Fire. And we'll get into it. So he comes by fire and blood. Should he not have divine jealousy? If he comes by fire and blood, should he not be divinely jealous and demand something from us? Remember our early quote? To whom they have committed much, of him they will demand the more. Should not his jealousy demand the more? Is it okay that we remain cold and tepid tepid of heart towards such a zealous and jealous love towards us from
from our dear blessed Lord? Think about it. The infinite is jealous for us. He's zealously jealous for us out of love. And yet we're tippet and cold. It's just like that picture when you go into the, um, what's that called? The uh, Sistine Chapel. They got the Michelangelo stuff up there on the wall. And they got the picture of the creation. So they got Adam sitting kind of on a cloud and his fingers, I don't know what he's sitting on, but he's sitting there and his fingers just kind of sticking out like this, like he could care less. And our Lord's fallen off of a cloud. You know, God the Father's fallen off of a cloud trying to touch Adam's hand. That's what the tepidity is. Now, okay, maybe he didn't have a soul or anything like that yet. I don't know. But it, 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 it does, it, it, that, that's kind of the way we deal with God. We're just kind of like this. And we, we make him fall off the cloud to come and touch our finger. Our dear Lord says, I am come to cast fire on the earth. He came in water and blood to cast fire on the earth. And what will I but that it be kindled? that the whole world be kindled with fire. And I have a baptism wherewith I am to be baptized, blood. And how am I straightened until it be accomplished? Think ye that I am come to give peace on earth? See that? So many of you are looking for relaxation. You're looking for a break. You're looking for things not to be so hard all the time. Just a little bit of rest. Think ye that I've come to give peace on the earth? I tell you no, but separation. Do you see the zeal? Our blessed Lord said that. Luke 12, 48 through 51. Don Delindo Rotolo. Don Delindo Rotolo. He was an Italian. I talked about him before. He's a... He was a very heavily persecuted priest uh, down in Naples. Some of you have seen the little booklet. It's um, Month with Mary. He did a beautiful job. He's got a lot of magnificent works, it's just they haven't been translated. I was looking in his scripture. He says this about this passage. Jesus Christ proclaims himself the conqueror of love by his bloody sacrifice and places love, heroic sacrifice, and charity as the basis of the Christian identity. He has come to bring fire on the earth, not that of destruction, but that of charity. And his only desire is that it be lighted. He came for this, submitting himself to a complete sacrifice and suffering that poured over him like a baptism. With his, with his love causing him to desire them with a very lively anxiety that keeps him in anguish until he has suffered them all. He also leaves this love and this sacrifice as a beautiful inheritance to his followers. Whoops. See that? It's one thing for him, but he leaves it to us. He leaves this love and this sacrifice as a beautiful inheritance to his followers. You have to ask the question, are you one of those? Since the conversion of the world will mean for them, meaning us, suffering, suffering persecution, and that even from those dearest, even from those dearest members in our own families which I get calls from many of you, that's the hardest. You don't know what to do. But I see many of you making very heroic choices. You're asking because you want to make sure you're not being imprudent, and that's good. And then I see you make very difficult choices. That's heroic. Gregory the Great says that this fire, um, this fire, that it, that it is sent upon the earth when by the fiery breath of the Holy Ghost the earthly, the earthly mind has all its carnal desires burnt up, but inflamed with spiritual love 
bewails the evil it has done, repents, and has the baptism of tears. Bewails the evil it has done, and so the earth is burnt when the conscience accuses itself. The heart of the sinner is consumed in the sorrow of repentance. This is a good consuming and uh, consuming in the sorrow of repentance. The heart of the sinner is consumed in the sorrow of repentance. This is one of the things that Asuna says, if you feel tippid, if you feel uh, dryness and you can't overcome it, you have to repent. It might be caused by your past sins. It might be because of your current sins. It might be because of your negligences. Repent and weep for your sins and inflame that is consume your heart with that fire that will re-enkindle your devotion. St. Ambrose says of this, that so great was our Lord's condescension that he tells us he has a desire of inspiring us with devotion, of accomplishing perfection in us, and of hastening his passion for us as it follows, and how I am straightened till it be accomplished. Let me read it again. So great was our Lord's condescension that he tells us he has a desire of inspiring us with devotion, of accomplishing perfection in us, and of hastening his passion for us. Think ye that I'm come to give peace on earth, I tell you no, but separation. That is separation from the world, the flesh and the devil, the threefold concupiscence of the eyes, the flesh, and the pride of life, as St. John puts it. From pride are born vain glory, envy, and anger. So just look, do you have that? Do you have vain glory? Do you have envy? Are you envious of your spouse? Are you envious of your neighbor, of your boss, of your brother? Vainglory, pride are born in vainglory, envy, anger. We have to root these things out. From the concupiscence of the flesh, Issues gluttony. Do you drink too much? Do you eat too much? What are the little dainties you want to have too much of? Do you, every time you walk through the kitchen, you're getting something? Concupiscence of the flesh. Issues gluttony. Lust. Sloth. Lastly, the concupiscence of the eyes is one with avarice or the inordinate love of riches. And don't think because you have modest means you do not have an inordinate love of riches. I have found just from our little appeal, I've seen how people don't want to, they'll make any excuse in the world not to let go of a couple of bucks because they don't trust God, they trust their money inordinate love of riches. Here is where we get the name for spiritual warfare. You have to fight against these things in every possible way. Root out which ones you have and fight against them. No peace, no relaxation, no putting it off. Be sober and watch because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion goes about seeking whom he may devour. At every moment, these things are being thrown at us. If you have sloth, you're going to get hit by them all. Whom resisteth ye strong in faith? 
knowing that the same afflictions befall your brethren who are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little, will himself perfect you and confirm you and establish you. But the God of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little, will himself perfect you and confirm you and establish you. 1 Peter 5.8 We say it, well, most of that, every day at Compline. So how do we kindle this fire? We hear these things, but how do we kindle it? I'm stuck. I'm stuck in a rut. I don't know how to get out of it. Especially like I can see in some of the marriages, you get so used to just bickering with each other or whatever it is that you're just, you've got these different things. How do I get out of it? How do I abandon it? Devotion. You have to, you have to enkindle the devotion. Webster, that, uh, that fellow, that fellow who made that dictionary. I don't know if he's a fellow or they just named it Webster. He's a fellow. Webster, the fellow that made the dictionary. He says, Devotion is the fact or state of being ardently. That's a beautiful word. Ardently. Dedicated and loyal. A noble soul is ardently dedicated and loyal. I was going to give you a conference this time about magnanimity of soul, but we'll do it another time. Ardent and dedicated. Ardently dedicated and loyal. What does devotion as a Franciscan consist of? As Franciscans, we should be ardently dedicated and loyal. Now, traditionally, here, here are things. I'm just going to give you kind of a rundown real quick because I need to get through this. Um, but I just want to give you some. You can search it yourself. I got most of this from, um, it was, it, some of you might have it. It's a, it's a third order manual. Um, the Handbook of Third Order, it's kind of a big thing. Somebody gave me a copy of it. As I think the Capuchins put it out in the 40s. First of all, to our infant Savior. Think of the joy of Holy Father St. Francis, the first nativity scene, and how he would fervently kiss the image of the babe of Bethlehem and stammer words is taken from him. Uh, I don't know if it's... Uh, Chilano that's saying this, and he would stammer words of joy after the man, manner of babies, St. Francis. So when he would see images of the, of the, of the child of, of, um, of the nativity scene, he would fervently kiss the image of the babe of Bethlehem, and he would stammer out words of joy after the manner of a baby, St. Francis. Just like sometimes when he'd get really, really happy, he would take a stick and play an air fiddle. He would dance around and play the air fiddle when he got really, really happy. There's also the devotion to the holy name of Jesus. It was the Franciscans who have long honored, defended, and propagated uh, it most strenuously. St. Bernard of Siena, when Leo XIII called, uh, called him the standard bearer of the holy name, preached it with all the force of, ex uh, of his uh, ex extraordinary eloquence whenever possible. He designed the now popular uh, monogram IHS, which we all see everywhere. He did that, and he got in trouble for it. The Dominicans, of course, uh, said that he was going overboard and whatever else. I think it was Dominicans, and he got brought before the Inquisition multiple times because uh, he had people basically bow down in adoration before this holy name. The Church of Jesu, the Church di Jesu, there in uh, the Jesuit Church that's there in Rome. That belonged to the confraternity of the Holy Name, which was given to them when Bernardino of Siena, 100 years before, started this confraternity. It was later given to the Jesuits. So don't think it's a Jesuit thing. It's a Franciscan thing, as always. Wore it, he wore it on his person. He displayed it before his audiences, and he urged his hearers to wear it and assigned it a prominent place in their homes. 
I've walked through, uh, I forget the name of the town now, but it's a, a port town there in northern Italy, uh, in Imperia, the, uh, it's the Italian Riviera, a beautiful place. But you walk through the towns there where St. Bernardine of Siena used to go there and preach. And every single, now that, that town's very, very old. You're, you're walking down these little narrow streets. Every house had the IHS above its door. And it's probably been there for 500 years. Every house. And we ought to do it again. It is he who brought about the name of Jesus being placed in the Hail Mary. See that? comes from the Franciscans and nobody knows it. Why? Because it came from a Franciscan. If it came from somebody else, everybody would know it. But that's just not how it works. St. John Capistran, at the invitation of Pope Clistus III, he recruited 35,000 Hungarian soldiers, Christian soldiers. They were just ordinary Christians about to fight. The Turks, because uh, Belgrade got, um, there was siege by the Turks in uh, 1456. And they're, you know, even John Huyadi, I think is how you say his last name. He was the general. He didn't really do it. It was John Capistran who on horseback rode around just screaming, Jesus, Jesus was the battle cry. And they defeated this enormous army of Turks. Right after that, John Capistran dies. And it was probably because he didn't sleep for like two weeks. Rode constantly on a horse, didn't eat anything, and just roused these troops to defeat this, this terrible Muslim army, which was the inroad to all of Christendom. And they, it was just the name, the, the name Jesus, Jesus. And they would the troops would get so riled up the Muslims could not hold them back. We, of course, have great devotion to his most holy passion and death. St. Francis even wrote a little office to it, which I'm thinking about having it inserted in the breviary, which we're going to be working on. It's a simple little office. It's, it only takes, it's like, it, it's not like a full office. It's just like these little kind of prayers you say at each hour of the day. And then, of course, you know, the friars have always taken care of the, 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 the sacred places of the Holy Land. And then to the most holy and blessed sacrament of the altar, the Franciscans, it, the, really that devotion started when St. Francis started having a great devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. And his writings on the Blessed Sacrament are, are incredible. And the, from that point on, people started going running around to different masses. It's not just from St. Francis. There was also a heresy at the time that they were doing this to combat it. But whenever there would be the elevation... Christians would run from church to church just to get to the elevation. And if the priest didn't hold it up enough, they'd yell, higher, higher. <laughs> so in the back, it's a very Italian. But they'd just be yelling in the back to just elevate our Lord a little bit more. Of course, his most sacred heart. Well, where does that devotion come from? St. Mary Alacoque. Okay. St. Anthony spoke about it very beautifully. St. Bonaventure wrote about it very beautifully. And the list goes on through all kinds of friends. St. Saint, Saint, uh, Bernardine of Siena preached about it very beautifully. So there was a great devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus um, all the way. And I think even, I forget who it was, St. Margaret Cortona, our Lord, showed his most sacred heart to her. This devotion is found in Francis himself as he so revered and honored and worshipped our Lord and his great condescension in his hypostatic union. This is the point. It's the hypostatic union. God himself becomes a man. And St. Francis, St. Francis followed that with everything and wanted, wanted to imitate that with everything. This union, this union was affected after the fall, right? Meaning, our Lord took flesh after the fall, though it was willed and predestined before the fall. So, because of the fall, our Lord comes as a suffering servant and not as a glorious king. If Adam hadn't sinned, he would have come as a glorious king. Where does that doctrine come from? The Franciscans. The Dominicans did not believe that. They believed the opposite of that. Explicitly taught. So, there, it's called the primacy of Christ. And it's what led to the Immaculate Conception, the dogmatic pronouncement of the Immaculate Conception. So therefore, it is this, this same decree which we, the sons and daughters of St. Francis, have and have always had such a, a profound veneration of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, the Immaculate Queen and Mother, the co-redemptrix and mediatrix of all graces, 
We have to think back to St. Anthony, his writings. He already talks about her as the Immaculate. St. Bonaventure does too, though his get a bit confused sometimes, but he believed in it. How the friars always defended her privileges, even to a vow of blood. The friars had a vow of blood for the, to, to defend the Immaculate Conception. That was for hundreds of years before it was actually made. The Stabat Mater, which we all know, we, 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 that's the, the little prayer we, most of us say when we do the Stations of the Cross. It's also the for the Seven Sorrows. It's, um, it's in the Missal and it's in the Breviary. That was by Giacopone uh, Giacop, Giacop, di Todi. He wrote that, Franciscan friar. That we fly to thy patronage, O Holy Mother of God, St. Bernardine of Siena. The Feast of the Immaculate Conception and the Feast of the Visitation come from the friars, and that was celebrated all the way back at the Council of Pisa, the Council, not the Council, the, uh, the General Chapter at Pisa in, in 1262. We were celebrating the Immaculate Conception and the Visitation of the Blessed Virgin in the Temple. I'm sorry, uh, the Visitation. And in 1263, but the feast of the presentation of the Blessed Virgin, the friars also celebrated that. That they they're the ones that brought that feast in, at least to the Roman Church. Feast of the presentation of the, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, of Blessed Virgin in the Temple. The friars were their principal defenders of the Assumption. Nobody knows that. The Rosary of the Seven Joys is so Franciscan; it's called the Franciscan Crown. And what else do we say? Of course, there's the Immaculate Conception, which the friars have, that's the, the great triumph of Our Lady's privileges, and that comes from the friars. Tanqueray says this, we can never adequate, adequately honor and esteem the one whom the word made flesh reserves as his mother, the well-beloved daughter whom the Eternal Father contemplates with loving eyes, whom the Holy Ghost regards as his chosen sanctuary. The Father, wishing to associate her so intimately in the work of the Incarnation, shows her the utmost respect. He sends her an angel who hails her full of grace and who awaits her fiat. The Protestants just say, well, if she would have just said no, he just would have asked somebody else. Well, that doesn't make any sense. The Son reveres, loves, and obeys her as his mother. The Holy Ghost comes and takes his delight in her. When therefore we venerate the Blessed Virgin, we join with the three divine persons in esteeming what they themselves esteem. That's beautiful. That's from Tanqueray. If you have Tanqueray's book, now everybody's going to say, who's Tanqueray? But if you have Tanqueray's book, it's number 164. Blessed Thomas of Chilano says, Towards the mother of Jesus, he, Francis, was filled with an inexpressible love because it was she who made the Lord of Majesty our brother. He sang special praises to her, poured out prayers to her, offered her his affections, so many and so great that the tongue of man cannot recount them. Now, Chilano, Blessed Chilano is the one who wrote, he was a companion, St. Francis, and was told by Gregory the Ninth, a companion of St. Francis, not a companion in that sense, but spent a lot of time with him. He commissioned him under obedience to write the life of St. Francis, and that's what Thomas Chilano is writing. But he continues and says this, Blessed Chilano says this, But we delight most, but what delights us most he made her the advocate of the order and placed her under her wings, the sons he was about to leave, that she might cherish them and protect them to the end. St. Francis made her the advocate of the order. He consecrated the order to the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Franciscan order is one of the Marian orders in the church par excellence. That's why I don't like the title Marian Franciscans. Our title is Marian Friars Minor, but we are not Marian Franciscans, we're Franciscans, because Franciscans are Marian to the absolute maximum. 
To say that we were Marian Franciscans is to say that we're something other than just Franciscan. It is to limit us, actually. To say we're Franciscan means we're absolutely, unlimitedly co consecrated to Our Lady as, as hers. That's what makes you a Franciscan, to be consecrated unlimitedly to the Blessed Virgin Mary. So to add and say, but I'm a Marian Franciscan, that doesn't make any sense. So lift up your drooping hands. Do all that you can to offer to our Lord that fire which he wills to be cast onto the earth. Our devotion will put, put us out of our tepidity. And when our dear, blessed, and most holy Lord sees our longing to be salted with fire, as Venerable Bede understands it, by the charity of the Holy Ghost and his grace, and the gift of discretion by which he guides us into all good to be salted with fire. Other commentaries would be, you know, going to hell. But it's a way of looking at it. Venerable Bede sees it as, a, as this charity, right? And so our devotion is to be fire, is to be in fire and blood. So as to keep off the, mm, this is a quote from Venerable Bede, so as to keep off the uh, uh, putrefying worms, then that which is salted with fire, that is, seasoned again with, with flames, on which salt is sprinkled not only to cast off worms, but also consumes the flesh itself. Therefore, the body is to be preserved with continence and the mind with the seasoning of wisdom. For salt means the sweetness of wisdom and fire, the grace of the Holy Spirit. Beautiful, beautiful quote. I'm going to leave you with this. A magnificent prayer of St. Francis. These kind of prayers should light our hearts back on fire. Hail, Holy Lady, Most Holy Queen, Mary, Mother of God, Ever Virgin, chosen by the Most Holy Father in Heaven, consecrated by Him, with His Most Holy Beloved Son, and with the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, on you descended, and in you still remains, all the fullness of grace and every good. Hail his palace. Hail his tabernacle. Hail his robe. Hail his handmaid. Hail his mother. And hail all holy virtues who by the grace and inspiration of the Holy Spirit are poured into the hearts of the faithful so that faithless no longer they may be made faithful servants of God through you. Amen. So let us pick up our drooping hands, as we said, and just start fighting again. We have to do what we can, and each of us have to do it in our own different way. We do that through keeping our spiritual reading. We do it more by making our meditation. You need to make your meditations. Spending time with our Lord. Something that I scoff at sometimes, but not seriously, is the fact that they say when you're really busy, pray double. I'm like, well, how am I supposed to do that? I'm really busy. But that's just it. You do. You do have to pray more. I don't know about praying double, but you can't put off prayer because you're so busy. You've got to stop and start sorting things back out. You're losing. You're losing your fervor. You're extinguishing, as St. Francis says, your spirit of prayer. And therefore, we are not the salt of the earth. We just become the earth. Do you see? We can't let the the tribulation the difficulties the the work the whatever else it is trample the spirit of god out of us because we weren't created for the work of the earth we were, we have to work by the sweat of our brow but we have to do it for the love of god and so let's keep this devotion because there's no there's nothing contrary in the fact that you have to work and pray you have to pray and work and they have to go side by side if you're not doing that right now, 
then you need to start struggling through it and make that a virtue that you have. But we have to do it. So God love you. Know that we friars know that this is difficult. We also, we work a lot. And we have a lot of work to do. And we have a lot of prayers to do. Um, and sometimes we work a little bit too much because we have deadlines and things like that. Or we have a major project that can't be put off. Or we have to depend on the weather or something like that. And you can feel it setting in. And so I think what we're going to start doing, though we have a massive amount of work that we have to do and so very little time to do it, um, I think we're going to start implementing a more prayer, uh, more, more days of prayer and recollection, because we can't give ourselves over to too much work and, and stop being servants of the living God. He created us so we'd be holy, not workers. He wants us to be holy workers. So work is holy. We can, we can sanctify it, but it can't be the end the end of what we're doing because there's just no point to it. There's no point to do all this work and then end up in hell or with little virtue. God deserves to have beautiful, beautiful servants uh, who are adorned with virtue. So God love you. Mm -hmm.